Yorkshire, England's largest county, a land of broad acres and distinctive character. The county is divided into three ridings, a word derived from the Norse ridding, meaning a third part. There is a north, east and west riding, but no south riding. Curiously, the county town York, which was founded 2,000 years ago, is in none of the three, but constitutes a separate miniature county on its own. York is the best example of a fortified town in England, with several well-preserved gates, or bars. Micklegate Bar was the royal entrance from the south, and it was the custom to display the heads of traitors from its battlements. The head of a former Duke of York was hung here, so that it was said York looked down upon York. A walk round the city walls is an experience that cannot be matched elsewhere. They are 5,000 yards in length and enclose an area of 263 acres. The ancient street known as the Shambles has the distinction of being mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Known originally as the Flesh Shambles, or Street of the Butchers, the name derives from Shamel, a bench on which meat was displayed. The Shambles is a centre of what has been described as the last medieval area of any size that exists in the world. York Minster, the fifth church to be built on this site, and is the largest medieval cathedral in England. It has the largest tower and contains more medieval glass than all the other English churches put together. The Five Sisters is probably the best known window, but the Great East Window has the distinction of being the largest single area of glass in the world. From the largest church in England to the smallest, at Up Leatham, in the shadow of the Cleveland Hills, is a tiny church in which services are occasionally held. Bridge Chantry chapels are extremely rare in England, but Yorkshire has two of these. At Rotherham in South Yorkshire, a 15th century bridge across the River Rother carries a well-preserved example. Yorkshire's other bridge chantry is at Wakefield astride the River Calder. This is a larger chapel, and whilst it has been extensively restored, it remains the best example of its kind in England. Chantries were used for saying masses for the souls of the dead, and bridge chantries were used particularly by travellers and pilgrims. from ancient bridges to their modern counterparts. Newport Bridge spans the River Tees at Middlesbrough and is the world's highest lifting bridge. The supporting towers are 200 feet high and rest on foundations 86 feet below water level. To allow the passage of river traffic, the central portion of roadway, 265 feet long and 66 feet wide, can be raised by electrical gear and steel cables to a height of 120 feet above water level in less than a minute. Further down the river at Port Darlington is the world's longest transporter bridge, 850 feet in length and 250 feet high. The travelling platform suspended on steel cables can carry 600 people and 10 vehicles. Still in sight of the Cleveland Hills, in the churchyard of Bolton-on-Swale, we can find a monument to Henry Jenkins, who was born in 1500 and died in 1670 at the ripe old age of 169. He lived through eight reigns, was a keen angler for 140 years, and was still a strong swimmer when well turned 100. 
As a boy, he carried arrows to the battlefield of Flodden, and 140 years later was still taking his turn at the harvest. If the story of Henry Jenkins seems a bit steep, then what about this hill at Gromont on the Gothland Moors? This district abounds with steep hills, but nowhere in the country can an official road sign be found indicating a steeper gradient than one in three. At Gromont we can also see the world's oldest railway tunnel. Built in 1836 on the Whitby and Pickering horse-drawn railway, it owes its survival to the section of line on which it stands was bypassed and abandoned some ten years later. It is 120 yards long and just large enough to admit a horse-drawn coach with passengers on top. A curious light railway survives at Shipley. This is operated by cables and carries passengers to the top of Shipley Glen, a noted beauty spot. Talking of railways, the Middleton Colliery Railway at Leeds was the first to be sanctioned by Act of Parliament in 1758 and the first line on which steam locomotives were used successfully, that was in 1812. It was closed down in 1959 after 200 years of continuous operation. Also at Leeds can be seen a curious factory chimney which is a replica of the Giotto Campanile in Florence. Next to it is another unusual chimney built in the shape of a candlestick. Another remarkable chimney is to be found at Halifax. Known locally as Wayne House Folly, it was intended to be a chimney for a dye works in the Calder Valley below. After rising to 270 feet, however, it was finished in Italian Renaissance style, also to resemble a campanile. Also at Halifax is the base of the original town gibbet, where up to 1650, felons were beheaded mechanically on a machine which over a hundred years later was copied by French revolutionaries and called a guillotine. Hence the saying, from hell, Hull and Halifax, good Lord deliver us. Talking of hell, the devil is reputed to have left his mark at Borough Bridge in the form of the so-called Devil's Arrows. They are in fact Bronze Age megaliths extending in a line from north to south. Originally four in number, now only three remain, one having been demolished by seekers after buried treasure. They are of millstone grit quarried at Abbey Plain, Nairsborough, and transported the seven miles to Borough Bridge. The stones were shaped and grooves chiselled along the sides but the significance of these is not known. They were probably stationed on the country's main north and south highway long before the Romans built the Great North Road. They weigh 36 tonnes each and date from roughly the same period as Avebury and Stonehenge. On the Yorkshire Moors near Pateley Bridge are other huge stones, this time fashioned by the whims of nature. Brimham rocks are a relic of the last ice age. Owing to its lofty position, this rocky outcrop stood above the ice level and was split into fantastic shapes by searing winds and biting frosts. When the ice receded, the bases of many single stones were reduced by a process of natural sandblasting. This weird collection of rocks lies at a thousand feet above sea level, bounded on all sides by desolate moorland. Also in the Yorkshire Dales, on the moors above Masham, is another astonishing accumulation of stones, this time the work of man. This apparently ancient Druid's temple is not quite what it seems, however. It dates only from the last century when, during an agricultural depression, the Lord of the Manor had to find occupation for his estate workers. He set them to fashioning huge stones and building this representation of a Druid's temple. Although spurious, its setting is authentic and gives a good impression of how such a place might have appeared.
Ilkley Moor has a really ancient treasure. High above the town of Ilkley is the swastika stone. This carving was executed 3,800 years ago and represents an early form of swastika with curved arms. It is thought to have been a fire symbol and a protection against black magic. There is a similar carving at Tosene in Sweden and also at Mycenae in Greece. Not far away over the same moors is the hilltop village of Haworth, the home of the Brontes. Seen from the churchyard, where all the Bronte family except Anne are buried, one can well imagine the part played by the gloomy parsonage in the tragic lives of the three talented sisters. Contemporary with the Brontes was the great industrial expansion of the West Riding, and at Shipley, on the banks of the River Eyre, Sir Titus Salt built the world's largest mill. Around it, he laid out the world's first model village and named it appropriately Salt Eyre. The source of the River Eyre is to be found at Malham Cove, where the young stream emerges from the foot of a 300-foot cliff. Originally, the stream flowed over the top of the cliff, where the watercourse, geologically known as a dry valley, can still be seen. Wharfdale is one of the most picturesque of the Yorkshire Dales. Above Bolton Abbey, at the Strid, the river is suddenly compressed between rocks not more than five feet apart. The water boils fiercely through this narrow cleft at great depth, as if angry at being constrained. Downriver at the Abbey, the ancient stepping stones are still the children's favourite way of crossing the river. The church tower was under construction when the Abbey was suppressed in 1538 and so was never completed. Few motorists who pass through this narrow arch realise it is an aqueduct for the Abbey Mill. In the heart of the Hambleton Hills is Revo Abbey, unique in being built north to south instead of east to west, owing to the narrowness of the valley. At the suppression in 1539, the valuable roof lead was secretly buried. Unearthed 400 years later, the lead has been used to restore stained glass windows in York Minster. Another unique ruin in the same range of hills is Mount Grace Priory, the best preserved example of a Carthusian monastery. The order was devoted to solitude and here the monks lived in complete isolation from one another, each having a cell and a small garden to himself. Food was placed by lay brothers in a hatch so arranged that there was no personal contact. Their lives of prayer, hard work and solitary contemplation were made harder still by the vow of silence, vegetarianism, the privation of hair shirts and severe fasting. Even during their congregation in the small priory church, they were so hooded and cowled as to remain unseen by one another. In the priory herb garden, a bush of sylvester still grows. This rare plant was used in the treatment of earache. It is a curious fact that while many cuttings have been taken, attempts to grow it elsewhere have been unsuccessful. South of Mount Grace, on a slope of the same hills, is the White Horse of Kilburn, 180 feet long by 80 feet high. When laid out in 1857, 80 tons of limestone were required to whiten it. Another White Horse, a little more lively, can be seen annually at Ripon, 
when the arrival of St Wilfrid into the town in AD 670 is re-enacted. St Wilfrid was an early missionary of Christianity in the north and the crypt of the church that he built nearly 1,300 years ago can still be seen within Ripon Cathedral. The bishop and other church dignitaries receive St Wilfrid with full ceremony on the steps of the cathedral and the equestrian bishop saint afterwards makes a tour of the town with his original retinue of 12 monks now sadly reduced to one. The earliest Christian monument in the north can be found on the Gothland Moors. Known as Lilla Cross, it was erected in AD 626 to the memory of Lilla, a retainer of King Edwin of Mercia, who was killed in protecting his king from an assassin's arrow with his own body. In the same area, a still older relic can be seen in the Roman road which snakes across the desolate moor to the north of Gothland. In Yorkshire, not only roads climb steep hills, but canals also. At Bingley, on the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, the water level is lifted over 60 feet at one point by a unique series of five locks. This section of the canal was built in 1773, and in addition to the five rise lock seen here, includes a three rise, two rise, and many single locks. It takes a craft about 35 minutes to negotiate this five step water stairway which incidentally is the highest in Europe. The canal was finally completed in 1816 and the first barge made the 190 mile journey between Leeds and Liverpool in the same year. The district around Harrogate and Knaresborough is rich in mineral springs, but none more curious than the dropping well at Knaresborough, which has the property of turning objects into stone. In actual fact, anything hung in the dripping water becomes slowly coated with a stone-like layer of lime, deposited by the water which is a saturated solution of calcium salts. Also at Knaresborough is Fort Montague, a house hewn out of the living rock of the cliff side. And now to a house in a graveyard. At the South Yorkshire moorland village of Bradfield is one of only two surviving examples of a graveyard watch house. These were built in the days of body snatching when subjects for anatomical dissection were hard to come by. The watch house, whose windows commanded a view of the whole graveyard, was designed to counter the nefarious trade of the body snatchers who dug up by night newly interred bodies for sale to hospitals. Another churchyard curiosity is the medieval weeping cross at Ripley. Only the base has survived, the curious recesses being to receive the knees of penitents when kneeling to pray. No doubt there has also been weeping of another kind at the village stocks of which Ripley possesses a particularly good example. Richmond, home of Francis Ianson, better known to posterity as the sweet lass of Richmond Hill, has a curiosity in churches to offer. Actually built into the fabric of the parish church is a row of shops. The hilly nature of North Yorkshire lent itself in former times to the transmission of signals by a fire beacon. At Sneeton on the Whitby Moors is a rare example of a beacon fire bucket. 
As late as the Napoleonic Wars, a network of such beacons was strung across England to signal news of invasion. All around this moorland district, an unusual type of coits is played. Each village has its own pitch with a soft clay pit at each end. The game is played with iron rings weighing five and a quarter pounds each and is not unlike American horseshoe pitching. The antiquity of the game is reflected in the many strange terms used for the different throws. But throughout the length and breadth of Yorkshire, nothing is perhaps more typical or has achieved greater worldwide fame than Yorkshire pudding. Not the leathery cross between a doughnut and a scotch pancake that masquerades under this title outside the county, but the real Yorkshire article. The ingredients are merely flour, salt, eggs, milk and water. But the real secret is a well-beaten mixture poured into smoking hot fat and no time wasted in serving. The real test is that it should melt in the mouth. If it needs chewing, then it is not Yorkshire pudding. It should be baked in a rectangular tin, cut into squares, and served separately before the main course. And the final touch, it can be served with gravy, jam, syrup, raspberry vinegar, and many other garnishings. Yorkshire pudding and Yorkshire folk have one thing in common. They are both highly individual. And if some of their ways seem a little strange, they are the first to admit that there's not so queer as folk.